Warning, content may contain disturbing images of GB torture that is against international conventions. Look at it, look. Don't try and look away from the brutal, slow dismemberment of Gigabyte's GTX 1080 Ti Extreme. This video card was one of the lowest rated GTX 1080 Ti's that we reviewed last year, or well, two years ago now, ending up the least recommended out of every card we tested. This was largely due to poor assembly quality, using an odd mix of through bolts and heavy mounting hardware that added nothing structurally nor thermally to the design. It's also because the plastic shroud creaks. When pressed, like McDonald's toy plastic, it isn't really form-fitting, and the card is bulky to a degree of pointlessness. When we tested the 1080 Ti Extreme, we found that its thermal performance was worse than competition that measured 30% smaller, even when noise normalized to 40 dBA. And that's because the Extreme just doesn't make great contact with much of anything. Now, after a year of forced labor in our oldest rendering rig, we get to see the real-world side effects of a needlessly heavy card that's poorly reinforced internally and has been sagging for a year. That's what we're testing today. Before that, this video is brought to you by Thermal Grizzly and their high-end thermal compounds. Thermal Grizzly makes cryonaut paste for high thermal performance and conductivity without being electrically conductive, so you don't have to worry about shorting components. Cryonaut is particularly good for replacing stock GPU pastes, as Cryonaut is a non-curing compound. Learn more at the link in the description below. Here's our test system for the GPU SAG thermal testing. It's about as real world as it gets, especially from us. We typically put everything in an open air bench for performance testing and run through the, ther the, the numbers in a very standardized way, whether that's thermal or performance or whatever. In this instance, it's a one-off test. So we don't need wide sweeping standardization and we can do it in an actual system. Now, the flaw here, of course, as always, is that we have a sample size of one and that different GPUs, different video card assemblies will have different performance numbers depending on how they sag over time. But this is a pretty damn extreme example, if only because the name of the card is 1080 Ti Extreme. But it is an extreme example of sag because I, we have B-roll shots of this, but you'd probably see it in A-roll too. All I have to do is apply some upward pressure and there's like, an inch of drop off or something. So it's it's pretty severe. And what we're doing is we have it in a PMO1. We've got three front intake fans, it's stock PMO1. They are at max speed. Everything's controlled within this system. So all fans are controlled. The intake fans are all 100% speed. The GPU fan for the cart that's under test is 55% speed locked for all tests, which is intentional because it will all otherwise fluctuate and then all the data is invalid. And we also are logging frequency, which is important because NVIDIA Pascal cards are really heavy with the clock gating to a point where if the thermals look the same, it might be possible that the frequency is significantly higher in one test than the other, depending on uh, how it was down clocking based on temperature. So that's all controlled for and accounted for. We do tests with the bottom card installed and removed, depending on what we're looking at. Uh, the bottom card here isn't actually producing any load, so there's no radiative heat coming off the backside, not any meaningful amount. The fan's at about, uh, it's at the minimum speed of 23%. For the lower card, it's a 980 Ti, it's not doing anything. The only reason it's there is to create a closer barrier to the sagging card, because as this sags, obviously it's going to cut off some of that intake uh, area at the front of the two cards. So that's why that's there. And I think that covers most of what you need to know about the test setup. If you have further questions, we'll have a, a short article about this as well with the system components, but that's more or less it. So it's a real world test. What we're gonna do is see uh, in this real system that we used for like, I don't know, a couple years, but about a year with that card in it, is there a uh, performance decay in any meaningful fashion from the card sagging versus resolution. And the resolution was, uh, I gave Patrick the job of, I said, your job is to figure out how to make this not sag anymore. And he took some wire that you used to, to hang a picture and tied it around the, uh, the cables or the end of the card and supported it to one of the screws on the top of the case. It actually works brilliantly. We wouldn't recommend it. It looks awful, but it works really well. So for testing purposes, that was our solution. Uh, if you want to actually fix it, there's plenty of brackets you can buy and shove in there. Um, for this test with dual GPUs, you can just put something between the two cards, but the goal is to not obstruct the fans so we don't change the uh, intake parameters during the test. So let's get through the numbers. That's, that's all the test setup. 
let's go through the thermal numbers. We've got uh, additional testing with thermocouples on some of the components as well, so we can see how the MOSFETs and the VRAM fare with GPU sag this extreme. In the testing with two GPUs installed, we measured the performance when sagging at 49.5 degrees over ambient for the Gigabyte Extreme 1080 Ti, or 48.1 degrees Celsius over ambient when sag is eliminated and fixed with our wire. This difference is outside of our error margins, but it is overall insignificant. The same is true when looking at single GPU numbers, where we plotted an average temperature of 42.7 degrees over ambient with sag, or 42.1 without sag. This is also within error margins and not significantly different, and we don't have the test resolution here to claim that one is superior than the other. They're functionally the same. As a sort of interesting aside, this chart does consequently point out how a second GPU, even when idle, will impact thermal performance of the primary GPU, and that effect is, is exacerbated when the second GPU is doing work. Keep in mind that this is just one GPU and that we can't draw conclusions for all sagging GPU configurations from these numbers. It's just the extreme. Two other important factors come into play as well, both of which we'll look at next. First, NVIDIA's GPU boosting algorithm is heavily thermal dependent, which means that the difference in temperature that we're seeing, which is not much, could be complicated by how the GPU clock is changing pursuant to that temperature. So there may be knock-on effects and frequency that we need to look at. Second, component temperatures, particularly toward the right edge of the PCB, like MOSFETs, could be more affected than GPU core temperature. We'll attach thermocouples in a moment to look at MOSFET and VRAM thermals. As for GPU frequency, this over time plot will illustrate that pattern well. First, we'll plot the GPU thermals again. Once we reach steady state, we begin averaging over 2,000 cells of data for the thermal numbers presented a moment ago. That data came from this distribution, though note that we've chopped the chart at 2100 seconds, because it's really the same. The sagging GPU is consistently about one degree warmer than the non-sagging GPU, which makes sense when considering the distance between the first and second cards has increased, thus allowing more air to the primary card under test. More importantly, here's a look at the frequency for the sagging GPU. Overall, once steady state is reached, the average GPU frequency is exactly 1621.3 MHz for the test. Again, that's at steady state, so there's no further thermal movement. Next, plotting the frequency line for the non-sagging GPU after propping up the same Gigabyte 1080 Ti Extreme with an unobstructing block, we see an average steady state frequency of 1656.9 MHz exactly. This increase is about 35 megahertz, but our error margin for frequency measurement in this test is approximately 15 megahertz based on a lot of data where we've been able to look at the standard deviation. So there's not much significant change here. Keep in mind that Furmark is also a power virus, so if you're questioning why that frequency looks low in general, it's because frequency is instantiated differently in this workload than in gaming scenarios because of how the drivers are written. So overall frequency will be scaled lower below gaming frequencies, but we can still use it as an indicator of performance. Realistically, this isn't all that important. It's basically the difference between one of the board partner's pre-overclock configurations versus another's. So you can make the case that maybe a higher stock clocked GPU that sags is about as useful as a lower stock clocked GPU that doesn't sag. But beyond that, there's not really a difference. And even that difference is questionable as it's very close to error margins. So uh, there's a bit of a difference here in terms of raw numbers, but not one in terms of really meaningful impact. You're talking one to three FPS average difference depending on the game. So. Uh, not a big change. We need to see what this looks like with a single GPU though. Plotted over time again, we see just how little variance there is between the thermal results on a single GPU configuration. Our scripting allows the testing to align almost perfectly in this plot, and with less than one degree delta second to second, we can call this a wash. It's well within error margins. Adding frequency to the plot, we can see that frequency variation is almost zero. Once at steady state, we averaged the frequencies to be 1632.2 MHz for the sagging card and 1633.4 MHz for the non-sagging card. We are within our rough 15 MHz error margin and also within margin of the higher frequency card, or very close to it anyway, for the dual GPU test. So far, there aren't huge differences. The last place to check would be component temperatures, so we removed the GPU and disassembled it, then reassembled it with thermocouples on a hotspot MOSFET and GDDR5X memory module. Keep in mind that this test data is incomparable to the previous data as it required disassembly, and so new paste was applied. We ran two configurations, single GPU with SAG and single GPU without SAG, comparable to each other directly. For this test, we measured GPU core thermals as within one degree of each other yet again, placing within range of our first round of test results. 
Note that these are incomparable, again, as thermal phase change, but the proximity to the previous results is reassuring of test methodology. For GDDR5X memory module thermals, we measured the sagging card at 51.8 degrees over ambient and the non-sagging card at 51.3 degrees over ambient. Both are well within spec and also well within error margins, establishing no meaningful difference. MOSFET temperatures were within half a degree of each other, also well within error margins, and we're not anywhere close to throttling, if anyone's wondering about that. We're, we're about 70 degrees away from that. So even when trying to find thermal differences in board components, like the MOSFET toward the right edge, we still could not establish a meaningful delta. The dual GPU configuration produced the largest gap or the most promising difference in thermals earlier, but even that was minor, and the frequency difference really kind of becomes insignificant given the natural variance and how the program operates. This could also be used as a stand-in for cases where the PSU shroud is excessively close to the GPU. Same idea as a dual GPU test here. So keeping in mind that this is a, a single card configuration, it's a, uh, well, it's a single configuration. It's got one card or two cards, but it's all the same fixed hardware. It's the same GPU ultimately that we're testing. It's not like we had multiple that are sagging here. Keeping that in mind, we couldn't measure a meaningful thermal difference really in any way in this setup. So sometimes there's a difference of about a degree. And sometimes it was enough to start exiting margins of error. But even then, it's just, it's not meaningful. It doesn't really show up on the radar. And except for in extremely controlled scenarios and testing scenarios and environments, it's not a number that you will be able to to produce as a user and confidently know there's a difference with this setup. Now, that's not going to be true globally. So if you have an instance of GPU sag where you saw the opposite, please leave a comment below. Let us know what card it was and did you do anything to fix it? Uh, because, of course, this isn't representative of all video cards ever. There are a lot of cards that sag out there. There are a lot of really heavy cards, but it is representative of some of them. And so from that perspective, it wasn't really a thermal concern, ultimately. It wasn't really a performance concern. We do have concerns, though. Uh, one, of course, aesthetically, it just looks bad. It's not a good look. Anyone who doesn't know computers look at it probably won't know the difference. Anyone who does know computers, if they look in the system, all they're going to see is GPU sag. So that's enough reason for some people to, uh, to be bothered by this to a point of fixing it or maybe buying a different card next time, maybe something that's not as heavy or pointlessly heavy as this one is. A second concern, over time the card can pull itself further and further away from the PCIe slot. Now, will it ever get far enough where contact between the pins is, is reduced to a point of maybe creating some flicker or you lose display out occasionally? That depends, again, on the configuration, depends on the case, depends on how secure everything is. It's possible, though, we found some forum posts where that happens. So uh, potential concern, but something that can be fixed by just resocketing the card. It's not like it's going to fall out and crush anything. It's just that it's, it's slowly pulling away from that socket, and it's, it's just uh, contact could become poor with time. How relevant that is? Well, probably not super relevant, but something to keep in mind, something annoying to troubleshoot if you run into that issue. Third concern is that uh, over time, some cards that are particularly heavy on the right side, like this one is, the right side being towards the camera right now, uh, those might have less right side support, you might start seeing pads pulling away just slightly from some of those farther right VRM or power componentry. Uh, so like the MOSFETs would be about as far to the side as you can get before you start getting into minor voltage rails and things like that that aren't that important to measure or even that hot. But uh, the MOSFET line is definitely the, the more susceptible to a thermal pad pulling away with time as the heat sink sags. And this is more likely going to be a problem where the PCB is supported to a point either by backplate or, or just by better structural engineering than this card has. If the PCB is supported to a point where it's relatively straight, but the cooler is sagging, which is not the scenario we have on this card, then you're going to start seeing some separation of the cooler from the components it's contacting, and that's where you'll notice the MOSFET, the VRAM temperatures maybe, they're closer to the core though, start to rise. So that is the bigger concern here. And how relevant that is to you will depend on the card. So for this one, the card that we have, the 1080 Ti Extreme Gigabyte card, the whole thing is sagging, all of it. So the upside of that is that the PCB remains in contact 
that the components remain in contact with the cooler. The downside is that the entire video card is sagging. So uh, take, take the good with the bad, I guess. But yeah, the, the bigger concern is just going to be check the card that you have if it is drooping a bit and look in there and see, can you still see the thermal pad is contacting the component or is it starting to peel away with the heat sink as the PCB might remain straight? And that's just gonna depend on the design of the card and sort of the, the structural configuration of the cooler. What does it have in there to support the backplate versus support the cooler? And is it lopsided to the point of just supporting only the backplate and the PCB and not the cooler? But thermally, performance-wise, not a huge difference. So we didn't really expect that, to be honest. The, the most noticeable difference will be if you have a, a uh, case or a shroud or a uh, video card component or something close to the card that's sagging, because then all it's doing is, is just sort of truncating that window where air can get in, and that'll reduce the amount of airflow to the card. But that's a secondary effect, not a primary effect of the GPU sag. So pretty interesting case study, but uh, that's all it is. If you have cards that are, are really bad, maybe you have one that you know we have already, like you've seen us review the card, let us know what it is and we can consider looking at it. This was in here for, well, since we got it, we take the worst components we review and we put them in production systems. Uh, sometimes it works better than others. And so it's had a long time to just let gravity take its course. And um, we have plenty of other cards. So if there's one you're especially interested in, everyone upvote that to the top and we'll consider it for a future look. That's it for this one. As always, you can subscribe for more, and you should, or you can go to store.cameraznexus.net to pick up one of our shirts. This one is no longer sold, but we have other designs like this one, mod mat or otherwise, or you can go to patreon.com slash gamersnexus to help us out directly. Thank you for watching. I'll see you all next time.